Today on the Emmanuel Pulpit. The line that will divide every man, woman, boy, and girl runs up a blood-stained path to a skull-shaped mountain called Golgotha. And in the closing section of chapter 1, Paul lays out a simple but unambiguous case. It's as plain as black ink on white paper. All of humanity is divided by the cross. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. Every major religion and ideology has a symbol. Islam has the crescent. The Jews have the Star of David. The communists in the Soviet Union have the hammer and the sickle, while the Nazis had the swastika. But for those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ, the symbol of our faith is the cross. And here the Apostle Paul describes the cross and its message as the basis upon which God will one day divide all of humanity. That is, one day everyone will be divided into two categories based on your answer to a question first posed by Pontius Pilate. What shall I do with this man Jesus who is called the Christ? But you don't have to wait until Judgment Day to see humanity make this division. If you want to divide a cultured crowd today, just mention the individual sin nature of every human being and state that the only remedy is a dying blood-soaked carpenter from Nazareth and the world will divide. But that division is not new. It's been that way since Calvary. Now as we see the division of all humanity by the cross, I want to draw three basic truths out of this text. First of all, notice with me what I'm calling a contrast that is stated. In verse 18, which we looked at more fully in our last lesson, the Holy Spirit divides humanity into two very broad categories, those that are perishing and those that are being saved. And words the contrast like this, that the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And throughout the rest of chapter 1, Paul continues this contrast. He continues this distinction. He describes those that are saved and those that are lost. He describes those that are wise and those that are foolish. He gets this technique, no doubt, from the Savior himself. For Jesus often spoke of this contrast and divided the crowd into two distinct groups based on the people to whom he was speaking. For example, when Jesus spoke to shepherds, he talked about humanity being either sheep or goats. When he talked to farmers, he said that humanity would either be known as a wheat or a tare. When he spoke to religious people, he said humanity would be divided into the righteous and the unrighteous. And now Paul picks up that particular teaching technique. And to the sophisticated, self-appointed, wise crowd of Corinth, he talks about wisdom. And he speaks in distinguishing human wisdom and heavenly wisdom. Now, I want to say a word about each of those types of wisdom. First, what I have called the stupidity of human wisdom. Verse 18 says, The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And as far as the cleverness of the clever, I'm going to set it to the side. And then Paul, under inspiration, taunts the intelligentsia of the world in verse 20. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Paul says that God has taken all of our wisdom and turned it into foolishness. Have you noticed how the world thinks that it's smarter than God? And Paul just simply draws back from the prophet Isaiah. And what we have here is verse 19 is actually a quotation from Isaiah chapter 29 verse 14. By the way, you would do very well whenever you see a New Testament quotation of an Old Testament passage. You should go back and find out how that verse was used in its original placement in the Old Testament. Because something that was going on in Isaiah 29 makes Paul quote that verse. So we just want to stop for a moment and ask, 
What was going on there? Well, the king of the Assyrians, a man by the name of King Sennacherib, had laid seed laid siege to the fortified cities of Judah, including the city of Jerusalem. He had taunted the king Hezekiah and the prophet of God at that time, the man Isaiah. The city was going to fall. Hezekiah had sought to buy off the opposing king with a large sum of money, with gifts of gold and other precious metals. He had even taken some of the gold from the temple and sought to buy off this coming war. But it was all to no avail. The opposing king, the enemy of the people of God, was still coming and he had sent word, I'm taking the city tomorrow. Hezekiah brought a prayer request in before the presence of the Lord and laid it out before God. And here's what the prophet Isaiah said. He said to the king, not only will the city not be taken, but but Sennacherib isn't even going to be able to lob a single arrow over the wall of this city. The psalmist would later write of that great victory, be still, stop working, stop striving, cease your effort, be still and know that I am God. And it was during the night that God sent what the Old Testament simply calls the angel of the Lord. Hold that thought. God sent the angel of the Lord and during the night 185,000 of the Assyrians were killed by the angel of the Lord. Now why in the world would Paul quote that prophecy in relation to the message of the cross? I personally don't know that we could find any clearer picture of the cross of Jesus Christ. The people of God had done everything that they knew to do in their own wisdom, in their own strength, in their own intellect, in their own power. But the enemy of God's people was still coming. And listen, church, he thought he had them right where he wanted them. But at an unexpected time and in an unexpected way, a messenger sent to earth from heaven itself came and slew the enemy. Enemies of God and God freed his people not on the basis of their power, not on the basis of their experience. God freed his people by his own might for his own good pleasure. And Paul now baptizes that Old Testament prophecy and says that is exactly what happened to Christians at the cross of Calvary. You see, the angel of the Lord is an Old Testament reference to a pre incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. and Paul says to this cultured crowd in Corinth that in the same way that Jesus before Bethlehem came and delivered his people by his own handiwork in the same way now Christ on this side of Bethlehem on this side of Calvary on this side of the empty tomb is still in the business of freeing his people listen right by himself and if you think you're going to work your way into heaven You're too dumb to come in out of the rain. God has taken all of your supposed wisdom and turned it into foolishness. The stupidity of human wisdom. Now notice in verse 21 what I've entitled the superiority of heavenly wisdom. For since in the wisdom of God, you need to look at verse 21. This is a profound phrase. It's not there by accident, it's there by divine inspiration. For since in the wisdom of God... Now look right here and listen to me. What Paul is about to describe is something that in the wise mind of God, God did on purpose. Verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. That is, God set up a plan that the world would try to get to God, but God knew they would never be able to do it. For God, in His wisdom, knew that the world through its wisdom would not come to know God, but God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. In my estimation, the greatest truth, the greatest fact, the greatest wisdom of all time is that there is a God. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to save fallen mankind. To be wrong about this greatest truth is to believe the greatest lie. To be blind to this greatest fact is to embrace the greatest deception. To be ignorant of this greatest truth is to neglect the greatest wisdom and embrace the greatest foolishness. Now as Paul teaches and gives this contrast, 
He gives very clear indication that mankind has great wisdom. For in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. Now the world has great wisdom. The world has great knowledge. Through medical science, we can now keep people alive much longer than their natural lifespan would have otherwise been. Astronauts can now circumnavigate the, 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 the earth. They can now literally live in outer space. We can now genetically identify a human being by a single strand, just part of some material that we take out of a single cell from their body. Oh, man has great wisdom. We've climbed the highest mountains. We've crossed the widest seas. We have plunged to some of the deepest fathoms of the earth. Man has great wisdom. Tomorrow, Lord willing, I'm going to drive over to Brunswick. I'm going to get on a plane. It's a McDonnell Douglas MD-80. Fully loaded and fully fueled, it weighs almost 150,000 pounds. And I'm going to get on that thing, and it's going to leave the ground. Oh, man has great, great wisdom. But for all of our wisdom, mankind has never been able to figure out how to take a doomed, damned, depraved sinner and reconcile him to the God that made him. In fact, the best that the world has to offer sounds absurd to the redeemed. I quote none other than Stephen Hawking, renowned atheist and author who some believe to be among the most brilliant men in the world. A few years ago, he told a television series on the Discovery Channel, his belief about the world system. Here's what one of the brightest minds of the culture said, and I quote, We are each free to believe what we want, and it is my view that the simplest explanation is that there is no God. No one created the universe and no one directs our fate. Folks, that's the best that science has to offer. By the way, could I, could I just make a real practical point right here? The same crowd that last week couldn't even tell you where Hurricane Irma was going to make landfall until it was almost right upon us. That's the crowd that wants to tell you how, how, the, how the, syst- the world system began and how eternity is going to end. I wouldn't trust that any further than I could throw it. There's a contrast that is stated. Now this contrast is not pictured any more graphically than at the death of Jesus Christ. Picture Jesus according to the prophecy of Isaiah fulfilled in time and in history. He is dying there numbered among the transgressors. He is dying with a common thief on his left hand and a common thief on his right hand. When the crucifixion begins, both men are hurling blasphemies at him. But somehow grace came and invaded the heart of one of those men. And while one man is still crying out blasphemy, the other is crying out in belief, Jesus, would you remember me when you enter into your kingdom? One man died that day and went to hell. The other man died that way and stepped into paradise. Because one man died in his sin. One man died to his sin. And the man in the middle died for our sin. And all of humanity will eventually be divided along the same lines. I'm saying when you breathe your last, all that's really going to matter is which side of the cross of Jesus did you die There's a contrast that is stated. Second main truth I want you to notice in this text. I'm calling it a a, a confirmation that is sought. Paul knows that his crowd is playing show and tell. You you remember show and tell from grade school? I heard about a kindergarten class that was having show and tell. The teacher asked them to all bring something that would be a relic of their religion. One kid came in and he brought an empty box. They knew he and his parents were atheists. (laughs) Another kid came in bringing the Star of David. They knew they were Jewish. Another one came in bringing the Crescent. They knew that uh, that, that they were Muslim. One girl came in bringing a casserole dish, and they knew she was Baptist. (laughs) Well, in the Corinthian crowd to which Paul writes, he knows there's a show-and-tell crowd going on. The Jews are saying, show me something. And the Greeks, that is the non-Jews, are saying, tell me something. Some are saying, show me something so that my eyes can see it. Others are saying, tell me something so that my mind can believe it. And the answer for both crowds, according to Paul, is the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, as we look at this confirmation, listen, that I believe the world still seeks today. Notice first that some seek an extraordinary work. Verse 22, for Jews ask for signs. These are the people who are always going around looking for a sign. I want to believe there's a God. If there's a God, God, if you're up there, would you prove it to me? Let 11 purple camels and two red dinosaurs walk through those doors right now and I'll believe. Show me a sign. Oh, I mean, if some blind person could see, if some deaf person could hear, if a lame person could walk, then I would really believe. May I remind you, you're not cut out of any different cloth than were the people of Jesus' day. He did all of those things right before their eyes, and for his good work and his strong preaching, they nailed him to the cross of a common criminal. In fact, there was a crowd in Jesus' day that asked for a sign, and Jesus answered them in Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 38. The Bible says that in that day some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign. And yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I wonder... Could there be someone in this crowd today like was in that crowd then? You say, Lord, if you would just do something to prove who you are. Lord, I need an illustration. Lord, I I need a demonstration. Paul says, you want a demonstration? How about Romans 5 and verse 8? For God demonstrated his love for you and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said it, Paul repeated it, and I repeat it yet again today. If you want a sign, here's your sign. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, and rose again from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures. Some are seeking out after an extraordinary work. But there's another part of the crowd. They're not seeking an extraordinary work. They're seeking out after an earthly wisdom. I'm still in verse 22. For indeed Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. These are the people who say, well, I will believe if you can convince me intellectually and apologetically. And we should be involved in what is rightly called apologetics and defending the faith. But friend, defending the faith from a scientific or an intellectual standpoint will only take a person so far. There are those even in our culture today who will say, I will believe if you could answer one more question for me. Answer this question for me, Brother Lynn, and I will believe. Did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? Answer that and I will believe. What did Noah do with the woodpeckers on the ark? Answer that question for me and I'll believe. Ah, where did Cain get his wife? Gotcha! Answer that one and I will believe. My freshman year of college over at Valdosta State, I was sitting in freshman philosophy class. We got to the logics portion of that curriculum and the professor, who was an avowed agnostic, that means he doesn't know if there's a God or not. We spent an entire week Debating the answer to this question. Can God, if God exists, can God make a rock that is so big not even God could pick it up? He told us that philosophers would call this a quandary. You see, the idea if there is a God, he's got to be all-powerful or he would not be God. And so if you say, no, God can't make a rock that's so big that not even God could pick it up, it'd be impossible for God to do Something like that. He'd say, "Uh uh-huh. There's something God cannot do. Therefore, he's not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful. Therefore, he is not God. But if you said, oh, God can do anything. God could even make a rock so big that God couldn't even pick it up if God wanted to. He would say, gotcha. Your God can't do anything and everything. And this rock gone for one, two, three, four, five days. On Friday of that week. He finally decided to call on me. I'd been sitting there being quiet. He thought I was minding my business. I was just keeping my powder dry. I wore various Christian t-shirts and so he had already picked me out and he would very critically 
call me preacher. He was a prophet and didn't know it. What say you, preacher? Can God make a rock so big that not even God could pick it up? What do you think about that? I said, I think it's awful that a bunch of people are going to die lost and bust hell wide open sitting in a college classroom arguing about rocks. You want a sign from God? You want a message from God? Paul says to both crowds, the answer is the cross of Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews picks up this theme and says in the opening of his letter, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, God in these last days has spoken to us in his Son. God in times past spoke to humanity through a burning bush and a talking donkey and a sea that parted and a river that stalled. But now his final word is Jesus Christ. To the person who says, I'll believe if you'll show me something, Paul says, I'll show you the cross of Jesus Christ. To the person who says, I'll believe if you'll tell me something great, Paul says, I don't have a better story to tell you than this one. Jesus Christ died for your sins, buried in a borrowed tomb, rose from the dead, and the good news is if you will repent and believe that message, he will forgive your sin. There's the contrast that is stated. The confirmation that is Salt And all of it leads up to a conversion that is sovereign. Now follow along. Paul says in verse 22, Jews are asking for a sign, Greeks are searching for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block. That, that word stumbling block gives us our word scandal. And to the Gentiles, foolishness. So half of his crowd wants a powerful sign and the other half wants a wise word. But the Bible teaches, look right here, listen, listen. The Bible says that in the wisdom of God, according to the plan of God, God said to those who want a sign, I'm going to give you a sign, but you're going to think it's scandalous. And to those who want to be impressed with wisdom, I'm going to give you a wise word. But when I tell you what it is, you're going to say that's the most foolish thing I've ever heard. Unless the power of the Holy Spirit is drawing you to Christ. Now the question needs to be asked and answered. Why would God in His wisdom devise the plan of salvation like that? Two simple reasons we notice in verse 26 and following. First, here's some good news, church. Your ability is not a condition. But by that I mean your your goodness, your own inherent worth is not a prerequisite to you being saved. I've heard well-intentioned preachers say that the cross of Jesus Christ is God's statement to you of how much you're worth. No, 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 no. The cross of Jesus Christ is God's statement that there is a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He's the one that's worthy. You're not worthy, but Jesus is worthy. And Paul says, beginning in verse 26, consider your calling, brethren. Now, this is not the call to preach. This is not the call to be a staff member or a missionary. It's the same calling that Paul references back in verse 2. It's the call unto salvation. I'll say it like this. You need to think about how you got saved, brothers and sisters. Verse 26, look at it. There were not many wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world. And the despised things of the world. God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. Now I call this good news because you don't have to be talented in order to be saved. Brother Lynn is crystal clear proof of that. Now the Bible does not say that God did not call any wise or any mighty or any noble. So if you've got skill and ability, you're not necessarily excluded. But listen, brothers, brothers, if you are included in the gospel, it's not because you are smart or talented or have something great to offer God. 
Don't ever get the idea that God, before the foundation of the world, looked down through time and said, you know what? He is such a gifted speaker. Oh, man, I'll be able to use him. He's got so much to offer me. Oh, wow. Gabriel, listen to her sing. Oh, well, if I'll save her and get her out of the juke joints and honky-tonks and put her on the platform up at the church house, oh, I'll really be able to use her. Look at all she's got to offer. Look at that hourglass figure. I mean, she's going to win Miss America, and then I'm going to put her on the women's ministry circuit tour. She'll put Beth Moore out of business. Look at that beautiful woman. Oh, I can really use her. And in the American church, we ought to apologize and repent that we've got the idea that to be used by God, you've got to be a washed-up former quarterback from the NFL or a washed-up bathing suit beauty to be used by God. This text tells us that God doesn't need beauty queens and quarterbacks. No, the Bible uses some words to describe the kind of people That God, according to the text, is well pleased to save. Paul uses the word foolish. That, That Greek word gives us our word moron. There's hope for your teenager yet. Then he uses the word weak. That word weak is a combination of a negative participle and a word for strength that literally means without any strength at all. It it means nothing to offer. The word base, God chose to save some base people. I want you to listen to this word. I don't want to bore you with the Greek of the New Testament, but the word is a genus. A is a negative participle. Genus as genetics or bloodline. That is... God chose to save people who don't come from a royal pedigree. You don't have to have the right last name. You don't have to have grown up on the right side of the tracks for God to save you. God is in the business of saying morons and saving those who have nothing to offer, those who don't come from a good family. Then he says the word despised. Now you CPAs and mathematicians, that's an accounting word. It literally means to have no account. Nothing in the bank. You ever heard of a good for nothing, no count sinner? Nothing to offer God. And then Paul uses the phrase, the things that are not. God chose to save the things that are not. Leon Morris says this just means that God is in the business of saving nothings and nobodies. That means if you are smart and talented and strong and wise, and knowledgeable, you can be saved. But if you're weak, and poor, and uneducated, and got a rough background, if you know what it's like to have cigarette stains on your fingers and the smell of cheap liquor on your breath, if you grew up on the wrong side of the tracks with nothing to offer God, God still has something to offer you. He's offering you free grace, free forgiveness, free redemption on the basis of the cross of Christ. If you have been a good for nothing, no account sinner, with nothing going for you, you are still a candidate to be saved. One of the greatest preachers of all time, no doubt, was Dwight L. Moody. Moody was known for butchering the king's English, and yet he received an invitation to be the chapel speaker at the University of Cambridge, the cultural center of Europe. The students that were studying there heard that this backwoods illiterate bumpkin from America was coming to be the chapel speaker and they decided they were going to laugh him off the stage. Commentator Ray Stedman tells the story of in his ministry he met a fellow preacher who had been a student the day that Moody came to Cambridge to speak. He tells of how they had conspired. Boy, we're going to ridicule him, mock and heckle and laugh him to scorn. And so after Ira Sankey, the great gospel singer, presented a solo, Moody rose to the pulpit. And to the academic, intelligent crowd, he said, Gentlemen, don't never let nobody tell you God don't love you. For he do. 
The young man that gave his life to Christ that day and became the preacher who told this story said that that wasn't just his opening line. That was the theme of his sermon, and he repeated it every few minutes. Gentlemen, don't never let nobody tell you that God don't love you for he do. They didn't laugh him to scorn. They listened. And history tells of a great revival, indeed a great awakening that began that day on the campus at Cambridge University because an uneducated, unskilled, unlearned man was willing to be a fool for Jesus Christ. Your ability is no precondition for you to be saved. We see in these closing verses not only that ability is not a condition, but arrogance is not a consideration. This is where Paul has been heading for the entire section of the text. Why did God do it like this? Verse 29, so that no man may boast before God. You know how you got saved? You didn't get saved because you were smart enough. You didn't get saved because you were wise enough. You didn't get saved because you had enough going for you to make the right decision. Let him who boasts, verse 31, boast in the Lord. Now in these closing verses of chapter 1, we get a very clear statement of why God did it this way. And here's the answer. He did it this way so that no one could get the glory except Jesus. Now you sang this truth a few moments ago. I don't know if you know it or not, but you sang it, you sang it, you sang it. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory for the great things He has done. In Ephesians 2, 9, Paul teaches us that salvation is by the grace of God, apart from works, lest any man should what? Boast. Last weekend on Sunday morning, some of us were up here manning the hurricane shelter. And we were able to watch our friend Terry Trivett as he was preaching live from his church in Birmingham. And Brother Terry commented on the work of the Cajun Navy. Now the Cajun Navy is a group of volunteers from Louisiana. They formed in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. These are just volunteers with boats who go out to flooded areas and try to rescue Brother Terry commented on how when you watch the reports of the Cajun Navy going out to Houston in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey, the the television and the radio, they're interviewing people who've been saved by the work of the Cajun Navy. And he notes that not a single one of those people who had been rescued attributed their rescue to their ability to step over into the boat. They didn't say, well, let me tell you what it is. I've just got a strong leg. I've got a long leg, and I was able to reach over into that boat. No, every one of them gave the credit and gave the thanks to the one who came to rescue them. And so it should be for those of us whose eyes have been opened to the goodness of the gospel. We shouldn't spend our life bragging on our ability to see. We should give glory to the one who removed the scales from our previously blinded eyes. And for those of us who have heard the call of the gospel, rather than glorying in the fact that we had the ability to hear, we ought to give glory to the one who in his grace spoke the good news of the gospel to our heart. Rather than bragging about the way that we live, we ought to remember we were dead before one known as the resurrection and the life raised us from death unto life everlasting. Paul says, if you're going to boast, boast in the Lord. He would say to the Galatians in chapter 6 and verse 14, God forbid that I should boast in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Simply put, our testimony should never be that we had the good sense to trust in Jesus, but that God had the good grace to offer salvation through His cross. One of my favorite illustrations of this truth is found out west in the Rocky Mountains at an invisible geological line called the Great Divide. It is on this line that those who study such things say that the North American continent is ultimately divided. Rain falling on one side of this invisible line will make its way down the western facing slope of the Rocky Mountains and ultimately into the Pacific Ocean. 
while a drop of water falling just a half inch away, but on the other side of this line, will work its way down the eastern facing slopes of the Rockies and ultimately to the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. Two drops of water that started out right next to one another end up literally oceans apart. Listen very attentively. It's going to be that way on the day of judgment. Two people living in the same time, in the same town, going to the same church, sitting on the same pew. Maybe living in the same house, sleeping in the same bed. One will die lost and go to hell. One will die saved and go to heaven. And it's all because of the answer to this question. When you breathe your last and die, which side of the cross are you on? You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website, ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emanuel Pulpit.